And a good morning again to everyone. Welcome to our Sunday school. Let's begin our Sunday school by singing hymn number 273. Let's stand. Let's sing hymn 273. One verse only. Good Christian men rejoice. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Rod. You may be seated. We're going to maximize every second of this time together. We are having all the adults together uh, for this Christmas season. We uh, had a, uh, a weekend that we had planned for, and so we wanted to have everyone together before Christmas break. And we're actually going to start with a very special guest all the way from Argentina, and that is Brother Marcelo Lopez. So, Don Marcelo, venga. Um, Mr. Marcelo is um, a product of the ministry of Brother Todd, uh, Richard and Linda Todd in Argentina. And he was one of the very first converts that received the Lord. And uh, obviously with Brother Todd's current situation uh, in hospice care, um, he just wanted to give a, a word of greeting to the church and a, thank, a thanking to the church. By the way, if you're here and you're from the... Si están aquí de la, la clase de español, si hay traducción. Sorry about that. Um, so, he does not speak English, but uh, I will translate for him as best as possible. But he just wanted to take a few minutes and, and, and greet our church that has been supporting Brother Todd for so long um, to understand their heart and their appreciation from the Todds. Mm -hmm. Hacia adelante. Muy buenos días, hermanos. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> Doy gracias a Dios que el pastor Tad llegara en el año 1966 a la Argentina. He is very grateful for the Lord for Pastor Tad arriving in Argentina in 1966. Y ustedes fueron una iglesia que les apoyó desde aquel entonces. And we were a co-laborer with them, a church that sponsored and supported the Tads from the very beginning. Y cuando yo tenía 11 años, en 1968, and when he was 11 years old in 1968, acepté a Cristo como salvador personal. Él, sorry, he accepted Christ, <laughs> sorry, he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. <laughs> Gracias a su corazón. Al corazón de quién? De ellos. Because of your gift of love and supporting the Tots. He's appreciative of that. Su Reconozco ser el resultado de su corazón de dar a misiones. And he recognizes that you have an impact and an investment in the way that he received the Lord because of our financial support of the Tots. Mm -hmm. Doy gracias por lo que han hecho todos estos años. He's very thankful and grateful all of these years for what you, for what we have done together as a church. Y quiero darle gracias por lo que están haciendo and he en wants, este tiempo. And he wants to uh, say thanks for what we're currently doing still in this day. En los momentos difíciles, el amor se muestra dando. And he shares, which is almost what Pastor said this morning, he wasn't here, that in those difficult moments of life, that love is displayed through giving. Dios les bendiga. Muchísimas gracias. Y si Dios no nos permite volvernos a ver aquí, nos veremos en el cielo. So he says, God bless you. From the bottom of his heart, thank you. And if the Lord doesn't allow us to meet again on this side of heaven, he knows for sure that on the other side in eternity, we will be together again. Amen. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I, I am appreciative of, of his testimony. And, and I, in a way, I personally echo that testimony just two weeks ago. I, um, I was in Michigan at the funeral of my missionary, not the one that led me to the Lord, but the one that invested in my life and the life of my family uh, in the area of discipleship. And um, 
I went to Michigan and it was one of the coldest Novembers on record. There was snow at Thanksgiving time. And it was like, are you kidding me? But um, being able to share and, and really give thanks for their investment to their church up there. Um, and then when I came back the following day, I was speaking with Mrs. Steaker and she was reminding me or she shared with me how their church in northern Michigan supported my missionary who invested in my life in the Dominican Republic. And so it is a, a time of joy. And, and, and like, um, like he shared, we get to see on this side of eternity the byproduct, the result of that investment into missions. And so he, he is leaving, I believe, tomorrow uh, to go back to Argentina, but he did not want to um, say thanks to our church for all these years that we've supported the Todds uh, for their faithful uh, labor. And um, he is, like I am, a product of the American church investment into worldwide mission and carrying out the Great Commission. So I am uh, grateful for that opportunity as well. If you can turn your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Um, you should have received a handout or a, um, uh, an outline of today's lesson. If you have not, um, we have a couple of ushers in the back that have those available. Please raise your hand and we will get those to you. But in a season to celebrate that we are in the midst of, um, so some folks down here, we definitely have an opportunity to um, set aside some time. And, and personally, I am grateful for the American culture that from the time between Thanksgiving and the end of the year in December, we start setting time aside to really um, look back and, and give thanks to, to what uh, originally was intended to God Almighty's provision in our lives. Um, something that I did not grow up with. Uh, we just did not have that in, in, in where I grew up in the Caribbean. Uh, but then as we celebrate this time of Christmas and, and we celebrate the birth of the Messiah as a culture in exchanging gifts, we, we recognize the present. And, but yet towards the end of the year, we start thinking ahead of the hope of the future. And that definitely is the focus of our lesson today. That as we prepare for the end of the year, we start looking and contemplating that Literally, we're two weeks away, basically, uh, from that new year. And so as one year ends, a new one begins. And so we want to take a look at what God's word has to say in challenging us in this area. So as you start to look ahead, I don't know what kind of traditions you may have. Uh, I know we all have traditions that start on Thanksgiving. And, and I know in, in my home, my wife has established that the Friday or Saturday, the weekend after Thanksgiving, we start with that tree. And there's a particular CD, Christmas CD, that she has to play. That CD is older than some of my kids, but we still play it uh, every, every, um, every time we do this, the tree. Uh, it's funny because now you got uh, channels like Pandora or YouTube and you can put a different uh, mix of songs. But no, she wants that CD. I won't tell you the title, but it is definitely something that if we don't have it, we know something is not right. But we all have traditions. We all have uh, things that we like to do over and over. Um, one tradition in, in our home growing up, my mom always established in us, even when we were in grade school, um, looking ahead and establishing goals for the New Year's. And she would start before Christmas. And uh, she would start asking those questions, prodding those questions. What are you going to ask the Lord to do in your life? So I don't know what your tradition is. I don't know what you do. Um, but what goals will you be setting? You know, a lot of us look ahead and we start looking at, you know, what family goals can we put in place? What work goals um, are we required? I know that I was always required those. And, and, um, and putting measurable um, measurable things to, to consider. Um, I know we take the time to do financial goals. So I know we take the time to um, hopefully do physical goals that last about three days, you know, <laughs> when the, the clothes is tight after all the eating we do. But, you know, we all establish some sort of personal goals, I hope. But yet, have you slowed down enough to ask the Lord, what spiritual mountain do you want me to climb? What spiritual goals should I have for my life? And yeah, we can be subjective and say, I want to do this, I want to do that. But until it's measured, it's hard to determine how far we've gone. And so in today's lesson, if you are already there in Hebrews 12, starting in, in verse 1, we're just going to focus on these three verses um, to look at our lesson for today. And as the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which those easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. And consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning and just the privilege it is to open your word together. Father, thank you for this Sunday school hour that we can get uh, an opportunity to just simply um, grow closer to one another, but dive deeper into your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless our time together now and that you would clear in our minds and allow us, Lord, to focus on what you have in store for each and every one of us in this room tonight, today. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. First of all, just want to highlight a couple of things as we dive into our lesson that that first word, wherefore, that wherefore is a connecting word to the previous chapter. And whether you've been a believer a long time, you know by now that that chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is the faith chapter. Faith itself is defined in the chapter of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And one thought that is always resounding is found in verse 6 that says, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. And yet, as we believe the writer to be Paul, in the first verse, he, he explains faith as this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the, the evidence of things not seen. And so that is the definition that we have on the aspect of faith. So Paul explains through chapter 11 all these testimonies from the Old Testament of how by faith God accomplished so many different things. Now, I know that when we read that, we, whether it takes us a year or it takes us a month or three months or however long, we read all these things and we kind of snap our fingers and there we are, depending on how quickly you read. But yet, this chapter 11 takes hundreds of years. You know, from the very beginning to the very end, it's approximately 4,000 years from the time that this was written. But yet he summarizes in one chapter. And when he concludes the chapter, he even continues explaining how some heroes of the faith that are not named, but that are found in there. And then he connects, okay, what's next? And what's next is what our text is for today. So throughout the Bible, God uses these illustrations to really understand the nature of the Christian life. Paul, in another book, in 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. So he was very purposeful, even in his Christian walk. And that ought to be the desire of every believer. That we're just not, okay, it's Sunday, it's time to go to church, and we put on our suit or our dress, and we come, and that's it. No, it should be every day, with a purpose, and a measure of, God, what do you want in my life today? So in this passage of, uh, in chapter 12, the reminder here of laying aside, of the reminder of being ready is that of, if you may, of an Olympic game. And it's really not by accident because where Paul was in prison when he was writing these epistles, it was not far from the Roman Colosseum. And so he would hear the noise, he would hear the, the quote unquote games where so many suffered. In another letter from the same place in 2 Timothy, he encouraged Timothy by saying, For I am now ready to be offered. In 2 Timothy 4, 6, and 7, that he said, And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So this is a call to every believer to really be taking advantage of every single moment. And so for us as the local church, how do we look ahead to the new year and be ready for what God has in store for us? So in your handout, in your outline that you may have, point number one is that thought of the preparation for the race. The preparation for the race is found in verse one of our text that it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. So there is a call of letting us. And Paul himself is kind of including himself in that thought, including himself in the aspect that, hey, I need to do this too. So it's not only for the preacher, it's, only, it's, it's for every single one of us as believers in Christ that we are to set aside. 
God wants us to be prepared for the race that he has called us to run. And so that preparation may be different for every one of us. We're all made differently. I mean, even when you think about the disciples, not all the disciples were the same. I mean, you had John, the disciple that doesn't even like to recognize himself. But then you have Peter that the man got in trouble because of his mouth. He couldn't keep it shut. All right. And I know that we can think of somebody like that today. Don't point any fingers, but we know they're here, you know. And yet God used Peter in Pentecost to preach and 3,000 people got saved. Then you can think of Doubting Thomas, the skeptic. That I believe that one of the reasons that John wrote the gospel so, so much later is for those folks in society that are just like Thomas. That said, even after the resurrection, even though Christ had promised, hey, I'm going to come back. Until I put my fingers, until I put my hand on his side, I will not believe. And so God used all of the disciples. And then he brings Paul into the scene. Completely different than the other ones. A man so driven that his goal was to kill all Christians. But yet God redeemed and transformed his life and used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. So what is the race that God has called you to do? So in point number A in your outline, uh, the first word there is remove the hindrances. Remove the hindrances that in our, as we consider an Olympic athlete, that they have set aside certain activities or habits that do not help them towards obtaining their goal or in their training. In, uh, in your notes, there's Ephesians 4, and 23, and I'll just read it for you. It says that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That is the goal that Christ has for every believer of the renewing, the transformation of the mind. So we have the removing of hindrances. And these are not necessarily, um, as Paul describes it here, he says, lay, let us lay aside every weight. Those are the hindrances. But then he gets more specific, which is point number, uh, point B there, repent from sin. He says, and sin. So there's hindrances, things that are not sin, but keep us from obeying God. And then there's actual sins that keep us from actually being completely surrendered to him. And those sins can be described as something as not included in the, new t in the, in the commandments in the Old Testament. And, I, and we have to think of those by those of pride and even procrastination. And that procrastination can be that pricking of your heart of sharing something or saying something. And you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know what to say. Or, you know, I just don't feel like it today. But those are the moments that we are to obey the voice of the Spirit, of not procrastinate. For us to repent of that sin of pride, it brings to mind that word repentance. And to repent, it literally means to change your mind or turn away from something. So if I am going in one direction, I'm going to do a 180 in the opposite direction. Complete opposite. I'm not going to do a 360 because I will be back in the same location, but 180 in the opposite direction. And that is the thought of repentance. So when Paul is saying, let us lay aside, he is making a suggestion with a commandment that we cannot run our race unless we put these things behind. So we are to prepare for the race. But the next, point number two, is that there is a pace of the race. There is a pace of the race. And that is also found here in verse number one, that it continues and it says, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So that race, notice that it has a set pace, point A. That it has a set pace. It's not a sprint, but it is a set pace. It carries a thought that our course is set for you just like it is for me. It's not the same as the person next to you. It is obviously complementary, but it is not the same. So one of the worst things that we can do is compare our progress or compare our course. Because God has not made us the same way. And yet you have a gift that I don't have 
And yet you are to apply that gift where you've been called. And so how do we apply that? And yet not allow that sin of comparing, if you may, to keep us from doing what we're called to do. Each of us has a course set by God himself. A course to run, but understand, point B, that it is a steady pace, a race with patience. A race with patience that it's not going to be forever, but it is to be done with patience. Understand that when that course is set by God himself, and there is a completion date for that set course to be done, we have to understand that we must redeem the time. We're not going to have forever. James reminds us in chapter 4 that our life is but a vapor. Gone in an instant. And yet, we don't know how long we have. And one of the biggest misses of opportunities that I've ever had in my life, and one of the biggest regrets, is being sensing that pricking of the, of the spirit of sharing the gospel with someone and coming up with an excuse. Because come to find out, it's hard to replicate. It does not come back. And if there's ever been a regret of something I wish I could take back, it's been those opportunities, in particular one. There was one time that the Lord allowed me, and I sensed the spirit, but in my immaturity, I just put it off. But I kept on praying for that opportunity to come back. And it was literally 10 years later. 10 years later that I actually apologized to this man that I was sitting in his office when the Spirit said, share the love of God with this person. And I said, well, in business, you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion. And in my spiritual maturity, I fear man more than God. And that just burned in my heart. And praise the Lord, when I had an opportunity to send a, a letter out, I included it, and, I, and that particular individual received it. He read it. He picked up the phone and called me. And he asked, what you're sharing with me in this letter means that if a man is good all of his life and yet dies without being born again, like the Bible says, he's not going to go to heaven. I go, it's not what I said. It's what the Bible says. But yet, it is that opportunity that it could have been missed. It, and it was missed. But I praise the Lord that it was given back. So we have a set time. So don't squander the time that you have trying to run someone else's race or noticing what the guy next to you or girl next to you is doing, but be focused on what God is calling you to do. Pastor often reminds us, especially with regards to our role in the workplace, you know, that we are there for a reason. We are there to shed light. And the funny part is it never comes with an appointment. <laughs> Nobody says, hey, can I talk to you about your Jesus today? It's always about, hey, what do you think about? And then you have a choice to make. <laughs> it's just an invitation to uh, display the whole grace of God or to really just keep the conversation going. And, and I hope that we obey it every time because you never get that opportunity back. So in that thought of the set pace and then that steady pace of running with patience, understand that the Christian race is one, one step at a time. Piper was asking me this morning um, about the, the, the thought of, of, um, of a, a, she woke up and she was hiding something in her, in her hand. And um, I, I said, what do you have? And the typical answer of a kid that when they're in trouble is nothing. <laughs> I go, really? So I kind of reached behind her and was like, okay, honey, you're not supposed to have this. And that was it. She kind of left. And a few minutes later, she comes back. And, and um, she begins to ask me questions about church and about Christ and about sin. And, and I go, honey, what you did, you know, when I asked you a question and you said, I don't have nothing, but you had something, that's a lie. That's a sin. Oh. 
And if you've had a conversation with Piper, I apologize for what comes out of her mouth half the time. But <laughs> you know it's deep. <laughs> you know it's deep. She's, half the time we ask her, ask her, do you understand? And she's like, well, explain this word. So in her six-year-old brain, with English in less than 15 months or however long it's been, explaining sin to a six-year-old in something as simple as being telling the truth. That when the Christian is set apart to live the Christian life one day at a time, I was trying to explain the fact that you don't have to get saved every day, but every day you have to ask the Lord to fill you, fill you with the Spirit. And I realized I lost her. <laughs> she can get Jesus in your heart, but the Holy Spirit every day, that's a different story. But yet, that's the Christian walk. That every day, Paul writes, every moment that we are filled with the Spirit. So that we can be ready to give an answer as those opportunities come along. So in that pace that we understand that it is a set pace, that it is a steady pace, then we transition into the next two verses, and that is in point number three, the pursuit of our race. The pursuit of our race, starting in verse two, look at what the Bible says, that the pursuit of our race is looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So our pursuit of our race is the price of not only Jesus, but it is for us to be transformed into his image. That it is not for us to be, well, what does Plantation Baptist Church say, or what does Pastor Hunter or your Sunday school teacher, whomever? No, no, no. It is, are you being transformed this year into the image of God, into the image of Christ himself? That I'm not trying to see how I compare with Brother Charles, but that I am comparing myself to how am I comparing to Jesus? And the reality is, however long you've been saved, whether it's been a week or you've been saved most of your life, every year, every day, our goal should be to become more like him. A growing Christian is a lively Christian. We don't ever stop growing because the moment we do, we start dying. And that is not what we're called to do. So point A and, and the third point is there is that we're pursuing a person. We're pursuing the person of Christ. In your notes, we have Philippians 3.10 that, that the Bible tells us and, and it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his, res of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So there is that charge that we are to be conformed into the image of Christ even unto his death. That we are to be like him and in that power that he provides. In the fellowship that he, that he gives us. It is because of him that we can have access to the throne of grace. And so when we have this pursuit of the person of Jesus Christ. That we know that we can rely on him. That we know that we can be sustained by him. When the world comes out. And I don't know how far back you remember. But every Christmas there seems to be a hot toy. Every Christmas. Okay. So if you got kids under six years of age, um, I honestly don't know what's hot right now. So don't ask me. You know? Okay. Never mind. <laughs> so there's always a hot toy. But every year. Every year. And since my kids are not here. No. Every year. The last video thingy that we bought was um, the, the, the Wii. And I don't know how long ago that was. When my kids finally killed it, they, they played it to death, um, we just noticed how much time they had been spending. So we're like, okay, no more video games. That's it. No more video consoles or whatever. Every year in our house since then, we have been playing a joke because our oldest has always asked for whatever's out now, right? Um, and I mean, it's mostly me, not my wife. My wife is ready to assist in that process of giving those gifts. Um, but he's always been asking for an Xbox. And I don't know what model Xbox is out now. I know it was starting with the Xbox, and now we're like Xbox 3, whatever. And um, we, 
this is not from my culture, but my, my, my wife's Michigan culture is, can be somewhat sarcastic. And um, years ago, we, we got this box that kind of looked like an Xbox, kind of felt like an Xbox, except it wasn't an Xbox. And we took a Sharpie, and we, after you opened the paper, it said Xbox. <laughs> I know, it was kind of cruel, but... The point I'm trying to share is that every year, and, and he asks every year, every year. And now he's got Eli asking, so now I got two. And then the joke is, you know, well, Dad, we're going to get one for you so we can participate with you. And I always say, well, make sure you get a receipt with that. But every year it seems to be a new thing. Every year, every year, every year. And if you kind of think about your younger years, and what would be defined as success, whatever that may be. And I know that in, in my 20s, success was defined uh, with a career path. And, and then in my 30s, trying to figure out how to balance career and family. Um, and then it was in the last five or so years that uh, the Lord really showed me his definition of success. And... The great thing about God's success is that it is not defined like the world does. And the beauty of it is that it's been the same since the very beginning. Hebrews 13.8, which is the next chapter. We don't have to turn there. The Bible says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's a promise that we have. That when we stand firm upon the word of God, we can then understand. So this is the one passage I'm going to ask you to hold your place in Hebrews 12. Put something in there. You can put your notes and then switch over to Joshua 1.8, the fifth book of the Bible, so that we can understand God's formula for success. And I do believe it's a formula. So when Moses was done kind of carrying the, leading the children of Israel up to the point of the promised land, his replacement was Joshua. And I know we studied this before, but it it reminds us, especially as we set goals for the new years, of what God has for each and every one of us. That if you don't have the definition of success, it just so happened that in our English translation, this is the only verse that the word success shows up. No other time in our Bible does this word get, get used. And so the Bible says, this book of the law, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. And then it says, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all, not just some, but all that is written therein. And then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have not just success, but good success. And it's interesting, going through the emotions Um, that I know so many of you have gone through of um, having your oldest getting ready to leave the home. And and our oldest is graduating five months from Wednesday and probably leaving home three months after. And it gets very real. I mean, like, you're going to be kind of on your own. Sink or swim, right? Um, We had to take those floaties off a few years ago, you know. (laughs) Um, But the reality is that they're going to be leaving. And, you know, what have we done to instill the principles of his promises? But as my wife and I were were talking about instilling these wisdom, uh, the the wisdoms of, of the word of God, that the reality is so many times we 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 try to do things on our own. And that has been the case since the beginning of time, obviously. But yet. God provides it in a very clear way. And I know our kids have learned this, and I know you've read this verse before, but have you really slowed down to understand his promises? And when I said it's from the beginning of time, it's, you know, this is what God told Joshua himself, that if he did this, this is what was going to happen. And if you were to break it down in the formula, and then you look at the promises of the word of God in the New Testament, and you look at, the, the things that God did in the Old Testament by faith, applying the word of God in people's lives, 
that the yield, the differences. I'm reminded in Daniel chapter 1 that in Daniel chapter 1, at the end of that measuring time that they set themselves apart, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the king found these four guys to be ten times wiser. That's a measurable comparison. Oh, they were just not better. The Bible tells us exactly how much better they were. In the New Testament, when Jesus is talking about spreading the, um, the seeds in, 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 in different kinds of soil, he talks about that the fruit, the yield, would be 40, 60, 100 full. That's a return on an investment. So there's something measurable. But I don't know what it is about our Christian culture that we don't like to measure our Christian growth. And that or not ought to be. So as you start thinking ahead of the new year, are you making that preparation of setting aside, God, what am I going to do? I know for me personally, um, I don't know how long ago, but 10, 12, maybe 15 years ago, I was challenged to have a measured time and length and portion of scripture to read. And wow, what a difference that started to do in my own personal walk with the Lord. Because when Joshua 1a talks about doing it, doing all, well, how do I know what all is unless I read it? It's not enough just to get it here at church. It's got to be on your own time. So the pursuit of a race is pursuing the person of Christ. And then second, it is the pursuing of a pattern. The pursuing of a pattern. So if you can go back to Hebrews chapter 12, as we um, look at verse 3, look what it says. For consider him that endure such contradiction of sinners against himself. That's speaking of Christ. That when that thought of consider him, we see his example. That he was a servant leader. That even though we sing all the songs right now, that he was the king of kings and lord of lords, yet he humbly was born in a manger. I mean, think about it. This is before Airbnb was popular. That was the first Airbnb, you know. We don't have room in the inn, go in the manger, you know. And so they provided a place, but yet humbly, he was born there. Completely, radically changing their paradigm of the king should be born in a palace, right? That's not what happened. But yet, consider his example. First Peter 2.21 tells us, For even hereunto ye are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. That's the promise that we have, that we are not to follow the steps of a church or the step of any other person but Jesus himself. That's how we ought to walk. That's how we ought to uh, move forward. So let me, let me ask these questions for your heart. What are your goals for the new year? Are you preparing now to look ahead? What, would God, what will the Lord have in store? Are you... Do you typically write them out and check on them? Do you put them somewhere where you can say two months into it, well, this is how much I've accomplished. But write them out. Realize that nothing we do for him is ever in vain. And that's why in your handout that Philippians um, chapter, uh, chapter 2 is, is written there where it says, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. That nothing that we do for Christ is in vain. That Paul reminds us, like, he, like he's comparing it about the bema seed of the crowns that we will receive. That's the reward of the Christian. It's not just that we get to be in eternity, in heaven forever and ever and ever. No, no, no. It's so much more. That God is wanting us to receive those crowns as our reward because it is indeed not in vain. So whatever the Lord is challenging you of whatever weight to lay aside, whatever sin he may be pricking your heart about, and it might be something as simple as not living on a day-to-day by faith or squandering the time with unimportant things instead of the priority of putting him first. Whatever that pricking is, when we obey it, with sincerity. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for the time you give us together. Father, I praise you for just the faithfulness of God's people. Lord, I pray that we would uh, look at the days ahead 
and know and understand what you have in store for each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that you would be exalted and magnified through your people, through your local church. And Father, whatever you're calling us to do, however you're wanting us to change and modify, to become more into your image, Father, may we be found obedient to the cross. Father, that we would not quench the spirit and say, well, maybe next week, maybe tomorrow, maybe next year. No, 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 that we would do it today. Father, so that we would be equipped to move forward and be used mightily by you. Father, that we would be like Javis, asking you to increase our coast of influence. Father, that we would be found faithful in the little things so that you would allow us greater things to be over. Lord, I pray that you would find a sweet spirit in our, in our lives this coming year. And that, Father, we would reach so many more for your kingdom. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son. It is in his name we pray. Amen. I know we have a few minutes to kind of stretch our legs. If you're staying for the 11 o'clock service, um, you know what to do. If you're leaving, remember, no service tonight. Thank you so much.